Hi everybody and welcome to the online lecture for Chapter 5. Our textbook authors make the important point that power and leadership are interdependent but not interchangeable. Leadership is impossible without power, but merely having power doesn't make you a leader. For purposes of this discussion, we're defining power as the ability to influence others. Now, I found a lot of times students think of power as a negative thing. It is not. It is benign. You could use it in positive or negative ways, but power in itself is not necessarily a bad thing. I've often found in leadership interview papers that I've received in this class that when students ask their interviewee about power, how do you exercise power, or what are your thoughts on power, a lot of times they get a negative response like, oh, I don't believe in using power over people, or I don't believe I have power. I think that's a misunderstanding of power. It's thinking of it as a negative thing, as a forceful thing. And a forceful kind of power is only one of many, many types that we will be looking at. We're going to be discussing a number of different kinds of power. Each one has a name and specific characteristics that go with it. So you'll want to know the definitions of each of these and be able to explain a circumstance in which they would be used. The types of power that we're going to be looking at are coercive, reward, legitimate, expert, referent, information, and ecological. And in the slides coming up, I'll spend some time explaining each one of these at length. So let's take a look at some specific examples of the different kinds of power that are discussed in our chapter. The first one is coercive power, which can be broadly thought of as the power to punish. It's the power to make something negative happen to somebody else. So if you have the authority to create a negative consequence for somebody and they comply with you in order to avoid that negative consequence, that would be an example of exerting coercive power. On a societal level, we have punishments for crimes. Those would be an example of coercive power. They're intended to be a deterrent. With a leadership situation, you might have an employee that has a history of absenteeism, and you might tell that person, okay, in the next month, your percentage of absenteeism has to come down, or I'm going to reduce your pay. That would be an example of wielding coercive power over somebody else. On an everyday level, you might have a teenage son or daughter, and you might tell them, if you break curfew again, I'm going to take your car keys away from you. Now, assuming that the loss of the car keys is something they would like to avoid, and that you have the authority to do that to them, you would be exercising coercive power in that example. Reward power is the flip side of that, the ability to make something positive happen to somebody, to give them something that they want. So in the case of leadership, you might have the power to give your employees a bonus, a raise, a special treat of some kind in exchange for a certain behavior that you want to reinforce. An example might be if everybody meets their sales quota this month, we'll have a special lunch or there will be a bonus for everybody, or to tell an individual employee, if your performance improves in this area, you will qualify for a raise, something like that. Legitimate power, the important thing to remember about legitimate power is that it rests in the position, not in the person. And here's what I mean by that. The President of the United States, whoever that is, is invested with certain kinds of power, the power to do certain things. And we have seen different individuals come in and out of the presidency, but it's the office of the presidency that confers that power on a person. So whether or not the individual in the office is necessarily liked or respected, they still have the power to do certain things. Another example of that is a teacher. As the instructor of record on this course, I present myself to you as your instructor. I say, we're going to be doing certain activities and assignments in this course, and that's how you're going to earn your grade. 
And it wouldn't matter if it was me or somebody else. By occupying the position of instructor, I have the authority to do certain things. Same with supervisors at work. You start a new job, they tell you that person over there is your boss. That confers a certain amount of authority to them in your, in your mind right away. Okay. Another important thing to think about with legitimate power is that this power is reinforced by an organization. There's kind of an organizational structure behind this power. For example, as the instructor of record on this course, I have the authority of Western Michigan University behind me, conferring any power that I have to me. It's important to understand the difference between legitimate power and this next one, expert power. Expert power is held by a person who has a special skill. And because you want the benefit of that skill, they have the power over you to, uh, to share that skill with you or not. Here's an example. Imagine if you have a child that you want to learn to play the piano and you have a neighbor that you know plays the piano beautifully. So you go to the neighbor and say, will you give piano lessons to my son? And the neighbor is thinking it over and deciding whether or not they will do it and how much they will charge. In that example, the neighbor has expert power because they have a special skill. Um, another example might be your car breaks down, your brother-in-law is a good mechanic, you ask him if he will fix your car and he says, I want X amount of money. And that might be more than you want to pay, but you want your car fixed right away. That person has expert power over you. So remember with legitimate power, the one before this, that president or teacher might not have specific expertise. They may, but they may not. Doesn't matter, it's their position that's conferring their power. Whereas with expert power, it doesn't matter who this person is, where they fall on an organizational hierarchy or where they fall on the, the social ladder. It's that special skill that gives them a power because other people would want to avail themselves of that talent. Referent power is power held by somebody that you admire. So because you like them, you would like to be like them, or you would like to impress them or to please them, you will comply. So if you have a boss that you really admire, they might have referent power over you. Advertisers use this all the time when they get a celebrity to endorse a product. The idea is because the public likes that celebrity, they will want to use the product because they want to be like this person who finds the product beneficial. You might have an older sibling, a cousin, um, some other friend or relative who has gone to a particular college or has gone into a particular career, and because you admire them, you want to do that yourself. Those are good examples of referent power. Note that someone could have both referent power and legitimate power, or both referent power and expert power. And next comes information power. This is the power you have when you know something that other people would like to know and you get to decide whether and when to disclose it. So we'll say that information power is the power to decide who gets to know what and when. In a workplace situation, think of maybe there's going to be layoffs and you are a department manager and you know who is going to lose their job and when that announcement is going to take place. Other people would like to know that. It affects their lives. So you have information power in that case. And then finally, ecological power. Ecological power is control over the physical environment. And think of environment kind of broadly here, okay? You have charge of the resources the technology, how the work is organized. You might have charge over the actual layout of a workplace, um, what duties people do, who gets money for new equipment, things like that. So in controlling that physical environment in a myriad of ways would give you ecological power. On page 143 of our text, 
there is a great chart that gives the costs and benefits of these different kinds of power and explains them in a little more detail. Circumstances under which you might want to use them and pros and cons of choosing each type. So I recommend you examine that chart and think about the kinds of power that you have used in the past and the kinds of power that have been wielded over you and how you have reacted to those. So when studying the types of power, make sure that you not only can define each one, but you can give an example of when it might be used and that you are clear on the difference between some that are easy to confuse. For example, legitimate and expert power are often easy to confuse. So make sure you understand the characteristics of each one. Coercive and reward, flip sides of the same coin, and legitimate and referent can sometimes be confused as well. Just because someone has legitimate power does not mean they would also have referent power. So make sure you're clear on the similarities and differences there. Our textbook authors present us with an interesting idea in powerless talk. You might remember back in the first chapter, we looked at the symbolic nature of leadership and how leaders make choices in the way they present themselves. And those choices give an impression to followers about what kind of leader they are. Powerless talk is something we want to try to eliminate from our speech because it does give an impression of weakness. So what is powerless talk? Well, there's some great examples in the book. I like to think of it as words or phrases that sound like you're hedging. For example, if you say, I could be wrong about this, but, or this is only my opinion, but, or the word just, I, I would just like you to do this. Could you just do this for me? Or a lot of vocal fillers like um and ah. Uh, which is one of the reasons when you take a public speaking class, you're encouraged to try to work the vocal fillers out of your speaking. I've worked on it for years. I still haven't gotten rid of all of them, but it's something I try to be conscious about. All of those powerless words and powerless phrases can give a negative impression to listeners. So you want to develop a, a keen awareness of when you are using those. Now let's turn to the idea of empowerment. We touched on this a little bit when we were looking at transformational leadership, but let's explore the question a little more deeply as to why leaders would want to share or give away power to their followers. If you're using an authoritarian leadership style in a given situation, it might not be wise to share or give away a lot of your power, but under a democratic leadership style, you might want to share and give some of that away. And here are some of the benefits from doing that. It can lead to increased job satisfaction and greater cooperation among your followers because they feel that they have a personal investment in the work environment and in deciding their own, own fate. They're able to engage in some growth and learning so they can advance in their career and learn new skills. And it can help keep power abuses in check if power is more evenly distributed throughout an organization. So with that, it's time to go and work on the task list. And as always, if you have any questions or problems or anything about the chapter material that you would like to discuss further, shoot me an email and I will get in touch with you. See you in the next module.